We spend entirely too much time talking about the trifling, transient flummery of everyday politics, and that can get so dreadfully tiresome. So tonight, let's take a break from that. Let's talk about something that's actually awesome, something that stimulates the mind and uplifts the spirit. I've talked once or twice before about how it's sort of weird when a topic that is among one's normal areas of interest and study is suddenly thrust into the news headlines, so then one gets to spend however many days listening to people in the news media and elsewhere getting things completely wrong about it because it's not something they know or care about. It's not something they've loved since childhood. It's just a thing that happens to be in the news, and all the knowledge they possess about it is whatever they managed to assimilate while they were scanning some AP news article, which was also the amount of work that went into it by the person who wrote the AP article. But enough about that. They found the wreck of the endurance, and that is freaking awesome, which, if you've been living under a particularly heavy rock, endurance was the the vessel commanded by Sir Ernest Shackleton on the famous Imperial Transantarctic Expedition of 1914-1916, which of course, was an unmitigated clusterfuck from start to finish. None of the mission objectives was attempted, much less completed, but in the act of bringing all 27 men back home safely, a couple of whom wound up being killed at the Somme less than two months later, talk about your cruel ironies, Shackleton wound up writing the most famous, most inspiring chapter in the story of the heroic age of polar exploration, and, and making himself, though somewhat belatedly, its most legendary, most heroic, most inspirational figure, which he could never have known or suspected at the time of his death when he was exactly the same age I am now, when he was about to embark on another Antarctic expedition, which he felt like he had to do, since though there had been no shortage of accolades when he returned from the Endurance expedition with no loss of life, but... He was still acutely aware of the fact that none of his three previous expeditions to the Antarctic had achieved their stated objectives, and that bothered him quite a bit. It probably also bothered him quite a bit that Captain Scott, who, in attempting to beat Amundsen to the South Pole, had not only lost the race, but also blundered his way into the deaths of himself and his four companions on the return journey, was seen by the public as a saint practically a demigod, the highest ideal of the stoic British gentleman bravely going to his death for king and country. Now, in the hundred years since Sir Ernest died in the arms of Dr. Macklin on South Georgia, thinking himself probably largely a failure, those roles have undergone something of a 180-degree inversion, with Shackleton, now popularly regarded as one of history's greatest leaders of men, the guy whose crisis management techniques have launched a thousand corporate leadership seminars and 10,000 football coach pep talks, while Scott, on the other hand, is now seen, perhaps not entirely fairly, as a bumbling misadventurer who was more concerned with upholding the ideals of British chivalry and Royal Navy tradition than he was with utilizing the methods that were most likely to result in mission success and crew survival. Meanwhile, Amundsen, the guy who beat everybody to the South Pole and brought all of his men back home safely, he seems to stand aloof from the entire continuum of this heroism, the most successful explorer of the age having the most meager presence in the public consciousness. Today, now, just over a century after the events, but even though he's the guy who won, there's not really any emotionally satisfying narrative you can attach to Amundsen, since his approach to the whole enterprise was so cold and so clinical, and his diaries are so much less fun to read. Where Scott saw the quest for the pole as a test of man's courage and moral character, Amundsen saw it as an engineering problem, to be solved as efficiently as possible with the least amount of risk and the least amount of fuss. Which is exactly why Amundsen won the thing and lived while Scott lost and perished. Shackleton, meanwhile, and If you don't know the blow-by-blow of the Endurance Expedition, then do yourself a favor and pick up Alfred Lansing's book from 1959. It's called Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage, which if you've never read it, then you're probably missing the greatest work of narrative history of the last 100 years, in my judgment. I guess the highest recommendation I can give to it is to say I have reread that book more times than any other book. And I don't think it's especially close. If you're stranding me on a desert island and I'm allowed to have ten books, I'm bringing three copies of that one. 
That is how highly I regard this book. There also is a very good two-part miniseries from 2002, I, th I think it was, starring Kenneth Branagh as Shackleton, and he also directed the thing. It's four hours long, probably a better, more thorough treatment than the story could ever get in the format of a big screen feature. Although having said that, I am surprised that nobody has tried to make one. There are so few real world stories that make such gripping entertainment without any need for artistic license or embellishment. And if you watch that miniseries, you will see a lot of people in it who you recognize from things they have since done more recently. It really is a ridiculously strong cast and a well-made product. 27 men. They were cut off from all contact with the outside world for 21 months. Five weeks into the thing, their ship gets stuck in the pack ice. Two months after that, the ship goes down. They are left with 18 months to survive with three lifeboats and whatever stores they were able to pull off of the Endurance before the ice claimed her. Not only does Shackleton bring every man back home alive, but in all the 21 months of some of the worst agony and privation that men have ever endured on this planet... There was only one momentary breakdown in unit discipline. When the carpenter, Chippy McNish, the oldest, crankiest Scotsman on the crew, after they had spent three days pointlessly trying to manhaul the boats and the stores across this ice flow, he stops, he throws his rope down, he says, hey, fuck this shit, this is stupid, I'm not doing it anymore, I don't have to do it anyway, because none of us do, our ships sank, so our contracts are null and void, we're not even going to get paid, and we're not bound by ship's articles anymore, so we don't have to do what this asshole says. And it's what Shackleton does in that exact moment that is the difference between having 27 live men at the end and 27 dead ones. First, he produces the master contract, he reads it aloud and explains that your contract is with me. It's for the duration of the expedition. It's not contingent on the condition or even the existence of our ship. And second, since he's operating in the reasonable assumption that if McNish is saying this out loud, he's probably also speaking on behalf of at least two or three others, he produces his revolver and he calmly informs the carpenter that if there is any further disobedience of lawful orders or any attempt to suborn mutiny, then you, Mr. McNish, will be shot and I will damn well do it myself. Which is the same thing I tell Jim Eagle when he doesn't hit the music right on cue. I feel like there's a great Alec Baldwin joke in there somewhere. From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where the bloviating will continue until morale improves. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. Happy Tuesday. I'm your eponymous host and humble servant. And let's keep talking about things that are awesome. Because history is awesome. History matters. And when bad people try to erase history, or to smear historical figures as bad people because they fall short of some stupid, woke 21st century moral litmus test, it is our job, as thoughtful, decent people of conscience, to tell them they should go get fucked. Because they should. I don't make the reality, ladies and gentlemen. I just report on it. Now, with the wreck of, of the endurance now having been discovered, that's pretty much all of the famous undiscovered wrecks now off the board, and within a shockingly brief period of time, if you're somebody like me who's an enthusiast for this stuff, and I had told you back in, like, 2012 that the wrecks of terror, Erebus, and Endurance were all about to be discovered within eight years of each other, that would be, like, my mind exploding. That is crazy. That's too much to even dream for if you are an aficionado of the heroic age of polar exploration. But here it is. It happened. We've got the three most famous polar shipwrecks now having all been located within an astoundingly brief period of time, and they've all still barely been explored in detail. A few artifacts have been retrieved from Erebus and Terror, but there's still every possibility that something could lie within the wrecks of those two ships that solves the mystery of the fate of the Franklin expedition, and who knows? Maybe even the bones of Sir John Franklin himself will be discovered. The Franklin expedition is still the se sexiest one of them all, because it's the one with the tantalizing mystery that still hasn't been solved, even though there's been a slow drip, drip, drip of clues ever since that the first rescue missions were sent out in 1851. The burial site of Sir John Franklin himself is now, with the wrecks of both his ships having been located, 
that's the holy grail among people who study this stuff for a living. There, there are, are reports in the Inuit oral tradition that Franklin was buried on land, but there also is a school of thought that says they would have perhaps been storing his coffin on board his flagship, HMS Erebus, in the hopes that they might be able to extricate themselves from the ice pack and return their admiral's remains back to England for, for a fitting burial. And on the other ship, HMS Terror, which they found in Terror Bay of all places, th there's a belief that exploration might be possible of the cabin of the captain, Francis Crozier, to whom command of the expedition fell after the death of Franklin, and, and that if any written materials were found therein, it's possible they could be in a readable condition, provided they underwent proper recovery and meticulous conservation and the prospects for the wreck of endurance are no less exciting when the ship was a couple days from going down when the weather deck was still fully above water the only thing frank hurley the australian filmmaker photographer and certified grade a badass he talks shackleton into letting him take a couple of the fellows back over to the ship so he can try to salvage a few more things before she goes down. Shackleton says, sure, that's fine. Go grab what you can. Just be very careful. Don't take any undue risks. But Hurley is lying. He doesn't give a crap about grabbing a couple of waterlogged crates of turnips and almonds. He's going back for his film reels and his negatives. Because as he reckons it, if we all die out here on this godforsaken ice floe and some bastard finds all of our bones 20 years from now, there's not going to be any surviving visual record of this expedition and all these events. And then what the hell is the point of having done it? But the trouble is, all the crates and all the canisters, they're about eight feet down below where the water line is currently, and there's only one hatchway by which to access them. So Hurley ties a rope about his waist, he instructs the other two chaps to keep a tight hold of his ankles, and he proceeds to plunge headfirst into the refreshing 28-degree water. He does this three times emerging each time with another armload of film and negatives, and he wants to keep going back, but the other two guys are like, nah, dude, yeah, pretty sure you're going to die if you go back down there again, so let's call it a day. Because I haven't seen a woman in six months, and your lips are as blue as my balls, and I don't want to have to explain to the boss why I brought back a dead frozen Australian. Now, Hurley, by this point, his body temperature is about 67.2 degrees, so he's in no condition to argue the point. But all in all, he's pretty well pleased with himself. That's yeah, not too bad. Saved a whole bunch of stuff. Pretty good day's work. Feeling pretty chuffed all in all. But then he gets back to camp and Shackleton says, Are you fucking retarded? Your glass negatives weigh like a third of a pound each. There's 12 in each case, plus the weight of the case itself. And we're manhauling all this shit across the ice floe, carrying only the items we, we require for the maintenance of human life. You just almost killed yourself to recover this stuff, and we cannot take it with us. It just weighs too damn much. So a negotiation then takes place, in which Hurley first demands to bring all 500 of the negatives he's recovered, but Shackleton manages to talk him down to 150, and then he personally supervises Hurley smashing the remaining 350 plates just to be sure there is no smuggling of unauthorized negatives. Now, there, there have been dozens of documentaries made on the Endurance Expedition, each of them overflowing with original film and photographic footage, and the only reason that we have any of that is because Frank Hurley wouldn't leave without it and was willing to actually physically die so that the fruits of his professional exertions would be seen by the world. And if these 27 men all wound up starving to death on this ice floe, there will at least be some visual record to be recovered to stand as a monument to how they spent the last months of their lives. But here's the thing. All of the other stuff that Hurley couldn't reach when he was roped off with two guys holding him upside down by the ankles, it's all down there still. And we know exactly where it is now. And it's probably in pretty pristine condition, especially the glass plate negatives, which... They're probably in a better state after 108 years immersed in ice-cold salt water than they would be if they were sitting in a frickin' museum. We already have what we think is a wondrously comprehensive visual record of this expedition because it is that, especially the amount of film footage that exists, but well over half of what Hurley shot we've never seen before, and it's still sitting right where he left it, possibly in a recoverable condition. Some of the members of the expedition that found endurance and these are guys who've been studying shipwrecks 
for decades. It's what they do. They've said this is the best preserved wooden shipwreck they have ever seen, which stands to reason because I'm pretty sure this is the southernmost wreck that's ever been located and photographed. So the marine biologists, they're having a field day too. I guess they're they're already rewriting the book on, on sub-Antarctic aquafauna because there are creatures living aboard the wreck of endurance that are not supposed to be there, which, which previously have been unknown to exist in such southerly waters, but there they are. And that's a great story in itself. Finding a shipwreck from a failed expedition of 11 decades ago advances our understanding of marine biology in ways no expert could have expected. Which is just one more reason why history matters and why investigating the events of the past is always a worthy undertaking. Because sometimes we learn things we weren't even trying to discover. Things that had never occurred to us. And that's why... Our curiosity is the best character trait our species has. And there's another fairly recently discovered shipwreck that I don't want to leave out. It was located around three years ago, over 20,000 feet down, the deepest shipwreck ever identified and photographed. A ship that only spent three hours in combat, but went down a legend. I'm talking about the Fletcher-class destroyer USS Johnston DD-557 and her skipper, Lieutenant Commander Ernest Evans, Medal of Honor. The Johnston first went to sea the last week of October 1943. By, by the time we get to the last week of October 1944, she was one day away from celebrating her first birthday in active service, and she had seen no action whatsoever. But on the morning of 25 October 1944, she had no reason to be thinking she would see any action that day either. She was attached to an escort carrier group whose job was to provide close air support and logistics for the Marines who were going ashore at Lady Gulf to reclaim the Philippines. But then, all of a sudden, who do they see bearing down on them but the main Imperial Japanese Navy battle fleet? The battleships Yamato and Musashi, five heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, about a dozen destroyers. The task force of which Johnston is a part called Taffy 3, all of its ships combined, they displace less water than the Yamato does by itself. Yamato and Musashi, each, they've each got 12 16-inch guns. The Americans have got nothing bigger than a 5-inch and a few torpedoes. The planes on the American car carriers, they're being loaded for close air support for an amphibious invasion. They are not armed with munitions that they can use against enemy ships. In other words, Taffy 3 is just about as screwed as screwed can be. The Admiral says, We're screwed, boys. Everybody turn and run like hell, and we'll just try to live. When they all turn to skedaddle, Johnston is second to the last in line, and Commander Evans, a full-blooded Cherokee Indian from Pawnee, Oklahoma, he knows he's got to do something drastic. The fleet is going to get slaughtered if they try to run away because the Japanese have faster ships and bigger guns if it turns into a straight-line pursuit. Yamato and Musashi can use those 16-inch guns at their leisure while they're closing the distance at the same time. They will decimate the entire task force. And then the Marines that are going ashore at Lady Gulf will be defenseless and subject to being slaughtered en masse. Commander Evans, he then gives a five-word order. Flank speed, full left rudder. And given the order, he, t he tells the men on his crew that he's committing them to a course of action that is likely to result in the destruction of the ship and the loss of all hands. And he tells them so over the loudspeaker. He says, our survival is unlikely, but we're going to attack the bastards anyway. So Johnston comes hard about, goes directly into the teeth of the, of the Japanese fleet. She scores a hit and another hit, and then a total of 14 before she's done with her single five-inch gun, she somehow improbably manages to close to torpedo range. Having only been hit twice, she unloads a full spread, lets all ten of her torpedoes go, one of which manages to tear the bow off of the heavy cruiser Kumano. Meanwhile, the other ships that were in the column near to Johnston, the, the destroyers Hearman and Hole, the destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts, they see what Evans is doing, and they decide, he is one crazy Indian son of a bitch, but we can't let him go in there alone. And this all comes as a surprise to Admiral Sprague, the commander of the task force, who's up ahead in his flagship and sees these little guys all turning around with their unarmored hulls and five-inch pop guns to go give battle against the biggest battleships in world history. So he says, well, shit, okay. This seems kind of insane, but I guess we're attacking them. 
So he launches all of his planes with whatever ordnance they happen to be carrying, whether or not it's fit for purpose in fighting surface vessels. And in one case, a guy in a torpedo bomber who's carrying only a depth charge manages to bounce it right off the nose of one of the Japanese cruisers. And if that is not following your orders to the letter, I don't know what the hell is. Take whatever you've got, go drop it on those guys over there. Yes, sir. So long story short, the Japanese commander gets so confused by all this, his brain basically explodes, and he decides to turn tail and run away. And you're left with the greatest, most improbable victory ever won by an outmanned, outgunned opponent in the recorded history of naval warfare. Johnston takes so many hits they stop counting, but she is still in the fight until a 12-inch shell takes out her bridge and her fire control. Everybody in the room is killed straight away except for the skipper who gets his hand blown off. Evans is last seen standing back on the fat fantail, shirtless. He's got his shirt wrapped around the stump where his hand used to be, and he's shouting orders down to the guys who are now manning the rudder by hand with a rope, trying to get the ship back in the fight. She takes another dozen or so hits. He finally has to give the order to abandon ship, and nobody sees him again after that. And a story like the story of Ernest Evans runs smack up against several different narratives that the 21st century left holds up as articles of faith. A Native American guy who lived nearly his whole life on the reservation, guys like that are not supposed to become patriots and war heroes, and especially not in the Navy. I'm going to throw out a, a wild guess here and say Ernest Evans is probably the only naval hero ever to come out of Pawnee, Oklahoma. But a guy from his background today would be expected to hate the country and to view it as an oppressor. You can't be an American patriot when you're in a, with an officially registered victim group, and especially not a war hero. What the hell is wrong with you? And that story is another story that I'm amazed hasn't ever received the big screen Hollywood treatment. We can make 36 movies about Midway, but we can't have one movie about Samar Island, which, which is a much more interesting battle, all things considered. The next time I am on some producer's casting couch, I am for sure going to bring that up. But that is it for me tonight. Tuesday and Thursday this week, since Wednesday is a hockey night. So thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Have a pleasant tomorrow. Do not comply. Get off my lawn.